Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to start talking about nuclear structure. So we're going to begin our unit on nuclear reactions. And we will start with discussing the structure of the nucleus and how that is all put together. So let's go ahead and get started here. And what we've looked at so far in our study of chemistry was looking at reactions involving the electrons within an atom. So everything we've really looked at so far involved how the electrons interact and how they bind things together as they try to form stable configurations, generally following the octet rule that we talked about. When we look at nuclear reactions, we are looking at what happens within the nucleus of the atom. And we've generally ignored that so far, assuming that the nucleus just stays unchanged. That's not the case when we start to look at nuclear reactions. Now, as a review, remember that atoms have a nucleus which consists of protons and neutrons. And we use Z as the atomic number for the number of protons and A as the atomic mass, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So the total number of particles within the nucleus. When we write a symbol, for example, for carbon 14 here, we have the superscript of 14 referring to the atomic mass, the subscript of six referring to the atomic number. And then the symbol C, same as the chemical symbol that we use for car carbon. And this would, of course, be called carbon 14. And you could have other versions of carbon as well that could have different number of particles in the nucleus. Now, we use the term nucleon to uh, refer to all nuclear particles. So that is protons and neutrons. So when we talk about the nucleons in an atom, we are looking at both of those. Now let's go ahead and look at an example here and going back we're going to actually look at density and we want to get an idea of the density of the nucleus. However that's a little uh, we can do that but we're going to look at it with an example of what is called a neutron star the compact remnant of a star that has exploded and has compressed all of the material in it down to essentially a gigantic atomic nucleus. If it has a mass 2.4 times the mass of our sun, where the mass of our sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, and it has a diameter of 26 kilometers. Now we want to calculate the density. So let's get the numbers that we know. First of all, the mass, we can multiply the 2.4 times the mass of our sun to get the mass of this neutron star. 4.776 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. The radius is 13 kilometers. Remember, we have to divide this by two because we're given the diameter. So the radius is half of that. And we want to convert that to SI units. So that would become 13,000 meters. So let's go ahead and recall that the density is given by the mass divided by the volume, where the volume of a sphere like this would be 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we can put in the numbers that we know. And in this case, we know the mass. We've determined that from the mass given. And the volume, we'd use 4 thirds pi times 13,000 to the third power. And if we go ahead and multiply that out, we find that the density of this neutron star is 5.2 times 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. Now compare that to water, which would be about 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. So it is far denser than water and in fact far denser than anything we can imagine here on Earth. Things that are very dense might be 20 or 30 or 40 times the density of water. This is many times that this is more than a uh, trillion times denser than water. So it is essentially what the density of the material is in the atomic nucleus and the density that you would get if you squeezed out all the space taken up by the electrons in an atom. And you're squeezing all those electrons into the atom and making essentially a gigantic atomic nucleus here. So let's go ahead and look at the forces that we're going to be talking about in this unit. And the force, the strong nuclear force is one of the primary ones that we'll talk about. And that is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. 
It acts between the nucleons. Remember, nucleons refers to protons and neutrons. And it is much stronger than the electrostatic forces. Now, this is important because otherwise nuclei would not exist because the negative the positive charges between the protons would push the nucleus apart. So if we just look at the electrostatic force, the nucleus should not exist at all because they, those forces would be pushed apart. Uh, those those protons. However, because this works at very small distances and is much stronger, it overwhelms the electrostatic force and binds the nucleons together. And we get what we call the nuclear binding energy, which is the energy that is produced. And these are far greater than the chemical bond energy. So we're going to see that far more energy is released in nuclear reactions than in chemical reactions. And we also want to look at what we call the mass defect. This is the difference between the calculated and measured mass of a nucleus. Now we might think they'd be the same, but it turns out that they aren't. And that mass defect can be used in Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared as the mass difference. And when we have differences in mass that can then be converted to energy. And later on, we'll look at that as the source of nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. And that all comes about because not all nuclei are stable. So there is actually a range of nuclei that are stable, but it's only a very small percentage of the nuclei and these fall in what we call the band of stability. So the band of stability here is kind of this bluish jagged line going up. And notice how it starts out low here and goes up higher and higher and higher as it heads up. What we find is that a stable nuclei of high mass will have more neutrons than protons. On this axis, we plot how many neutrons there are. And here we plot the number of protons. Well, when we look at that, this line would mean that they're equal. So an atom with 120 protons and 120 neutrons would be well away from the area of stability over here. So it would not be anywhere near stable. For very low mass atoms, they're actually about equal. So things like carbon, the stable isotope of carbon, carbon 12, has six protons and six neutrons. But as you get higher and higher in proton, move up the periodic table, you will find that they start to move uh, away from this, needing more neutrons, giving it more of that strong nuclear force to keep that nucleus bound together. Now we see the stability in the blue there the green are the radioactive nuclei that are detected the and they will fall around this area and they are ones that will actually decay into another isotope so they will change their they can actually change what kind of atom they are and we can this is one way that atoms are converted from one to another and we'll see how they decay into other isotopes Now, how do we find out things about the stability? What we find is that if we have even numbers of protons and neutrons, those are very likely to be stable. And in fact, if we look at all the stable isotopes here, of those 157 have even numbers of protons and neutrons. Another 50, 50 or so will have either an even number of protons or an even number of neutrons. And only five stable isotopes have an odd number of protons and an odd, odd number of neutrons. So very, very unusual. Out of here, we're looking at more than 250 isotopes. Only five of them will have an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons and be stable. We also have magic numbers. These are specific numbers of protons and neutrons that are extra stable against decay. And those numbers are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 
82 and 126. So if you have those numbers of protons or neutrons, then you have extra stability. And if you have a, a magic number of each of these, then you have extremely stable isotopes such as the ones listed here. For example, helium four has two protons and two neutrons. So they're both using the magic number two and that makes it an extremely stable isotope. Oxygen eight is another one calcium 20 and lead 82 are all extremely stable isotopes because they have magic numbers of both protons and neutrons. Now when we look at how these how this stability works, we can the, figure out the binding energy by taking the total energy of the nucleus and dividing it by the number of nucleons how many particles there are. That's what we're plotting on the y axis here against the mass number. So we can get energy as long as we are moving up the curve here. So we can get energy by fusion if we move from lighter elements up to heavier elements. And we can get energy by by nuclear fission as we move from heavier elements to lighter elements. But there is a limit here. And in fact, when we get to iron, in fact, iron 26 has the highest binding energy per nucleon. So so that is going to be right at the top here. And you can't get any energy from the, from iron. Iron cannot be fused into heavier elements and gain energy. And it cannot be fissioned, split apart into lighter elements to gain energy. It is the highest binding energy per nucleon. And one of the units that we use that we will see is the electron volt. And that's a way to measure these nuclear binding energies. And here it is given in joules as 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. So it's a very small fraction of a joule, very small energies. But we see that the binding energies can actually be given in millions of electron volts. So MEVs would be a million electron volts. Now let's go ahead and look at an example here. And what we want to find out is what is the binding energy of this iron and give noted that the atomic mass here given for iron. Well, if iron we can decode what we have here, iron has 26 protons. We know that from its atomic number because its atomic mass is 56. We know that it has to have 30 neutrons and then 26 electrons for a, for a neutral atom. Now, we can then go ahead and calculate the mass defect. So the mass defect is when we add up all of the different parts here and look at that we have 26 protons here. We add 30 neutrons to it. And in this case, to get the mass defect, we do need to add in the electrons as well, because those are considered in the atomic mass. So we need 26 of those and electrons are, of course, far less massive than either the protons or the neutrons. So we add those up 26 protons. So 26 times the mass of the proton, 30 times the mass of the neutron, 26 times the mass of the electron, add all of those up and subtract the atomic mass. And that gives us the mass defect of 0 0.5302 atomic mass units. So now we can figure out how much energy this corresponds to because we take that 0 0.5302 atomic mass units, uh, convert it into kilograms. So this is just the conversion of atomic mass units to kilograms. And we multiply it by the speed of light squared. When we do that, what do we find? Well, we can find that energy of 7.913 times 10 to the negative 11th joules. And if we convert that into electron volts, or in this case, millions of electron volts, we multiply that by the conversion factor here, and we would find 493.9 million electron volts is the uh, mass defect, the amount of energy there, the, bind, the binding energy per nucleon within iron. So if next we divide it by the 56 nucleons. Now remember when we're doing per nucleon, now we only look at the protons 
and the neutrons and that would be 56. We do not combine the electrons because they are not nucleons. So when we divide it we find that it is about 8.8 .8 million electron volts per nucleon for the binding energy of iron 56. And we will look at some other examples as to looking at nuclear reactions and different types of energy that can pre be produced in the coming lectures. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we found so far, we looked at nuclear reactions as changing in the nuclear structure. So not just the electrons as we've looked at in the past. We talked about the nuclear binding energy, which is the energy needed to break up the nucleus into its components. And we looked at stable atomic nuclei and we found that they tend to have even numbers of protons and neutrons or to ha or and to have magic numbers of these as well. So that concludes this lecture on nuclear structure. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone. And I will see you in class.